Welcome to Four Point Stance, Women's Tackle Football Talk on Fox Sports 1340 WHAP. I'm your host, Ashley Edmiston. This episode is going to be covering two rather controversial topics in women's tackle football. Elephants in the room, you could say. Right off the bat, let's talk about the main elephant in the room with the sport. Over the weekend, an article on NPR Radio was released regarding a transgendered athlete uncovering a bylaw written by the IWFL's rules and contracts regarding the participation of transgendered athletes. The athlete had tried out for the Minnesota Vixen, which at the time were part of the IWFL, and after it was discovered that the athlete was in fact a trans woman, she was denied participating in the team and in the league. Instead, she tried out for the Minnesota Machine, which were, which are in the NF- WFA. Teams have switched all over, but Minnesota Machine was a newer team. The IWFL states regarding players' participation, quote, A player may not play in the IWFL unless they are now and always have been legally and medically a female as determined by her birth certificate and driver's license. Females undergo hormone therapy in pre- preparation for sex change procedures are not eligible to play. Hormone testing must be conducted by a team's delegate through an improved media facility by the request of the IWFL. All, resort, all results will be re- recorded by the executive council. That's in the IWFL bylaws, in the contract, and it's very, very specific. Now, according to the NPR radio article, however, they say that the WFA, trans women are allowed to play as long as they've gender re- they had gender reassignment surgery, two years of hormone therapy, and have changed their legal documents to indicate they're female. However, the bylaws, rules, and codes of conduct don't state that fact. I've done tons of research on this. The only mention regarding a player is the fact that it literally says players must be female and 18 years of age or older. So unless there's a direct unsighted quote from the IWFL itself, the official paperwork doesn't mention anything. It's not as blatantly obvious as the IWFL is. Let's just say that much. And honestly, this has been kind of a major issue regarding most LGBT positive avenues. A lot of them seem to forget that the T stands for transgender. And if they want to claim they're an inclusive group, they have to be inclusive. And that's where I see that IWFL is running into legal trouble. The league, the team, were sued for discrimination by Minnesota state stature. So, and I, for right now, the league has yet to re- release an official statement. There is nothing about this. Everything that has been talked about regarding this issue has been, obviously, here and various other little side uh, podcasts and articles. There has been no official statements. We don't know where the league is on this, which would make sense given the fact that there is legal circumstances going behind this. What will be very interesting is both of these teams will see each other in week two, April 8th. All because the Vixen ended up leaving the IWFL apparently right after this happened and joined the WFA. But it doesn't matter. There's still a lawsuit against the IWFL and the team. So, if anything, it'll be interesting to see how this goes. Now, do keep in mind, my personal opinion is, so what? If someone identifies as female, they're female. If someone has transitioned, that's who they are. Um, I understand the concerns regarding sports and the advantages of testosterone. However, there are biological women that have higher levels of T in their body, and we don't question it. We don't question it in women's football. However, if we deal with a male-to-female transitioned individual, we always seem to put in these questions or these barriers that may not be doesn't need to be there. Again, that is my personal opinion. I kind of do think about it that having the IWFL put it in their bylaws, which you have to really dig to find, um, either said that the team, the league itself was prepared for the situation, but they didn't expect to ever have to use it. 
And I noticed that a lot of that's happening a lot lately. They have it in there because somebody might do something stupid, and then when it is kind of a legit common sense circumstance, they don't know what to do. Um, biggest thing is, I don't know Phil's mission statement on their website says that group of de a players dedicated to making the sport available to all women and girls that dream of playing the game. The league exists to provide a foundation for organizational pride, professionalism, and integrity of the sport of women's tackle football. If that is true, then will it truly accept trans women as women as well? If they medically are at the same estrogen levels as women, same testosterone or lower than women, have had surgery, have done the legal documents, then what does it matter? Again, that's my personal opinion on that. And who knows, there will be... Obviously, we'll have more come about this, and I know many of listeners that don't think the same way I, I do, but, you know, whatever, that's your issue. I believe in the whole LGBT alphabet, and that includes the transgender community as well. And this is something that is important. If we are to move forward as a society, we must learn from this and move forward from this in a positive way. Now, I don't think the IWFL is kind of getting out of this by themselves. I kind of have the other elephant in the room that has been around for years. Years. Is the conflict of interest regarding the WFA. It's been talked about for years internally. Just like, like for years. Um, last week I posted a poll on Twitter asking, is it okay for a commissioner to own, play, and coach a team in a league that they run? 81% of you said no. And I'd like to elaborate why I posted that. Um, the WFA is owned by Jeff King. And according to the website, he is the WFA president, and Lisa King is the director of operations, whom Jeff is married to. Now, where it gets interesting is within the league itself is a team known as the Central Cal War Angels. On their website, it says that they are owned by Lisa King, and Jeff King is the head coach. Now, the kicker is Lisa is also on the roster. She wears number nine. She's a wide receiver. Now, it's not unusual for owners to be players on their teams, and it's also not unusual for owners to be coaches on their teams. However... One, when locating this roster, if anything, um, was very difficult. I actually happened to find a mobile and went back to double check that I had it right and it vanished. So, it's very interesting that the roster is very difficult to find. But I, her name is on it. Her name has been on it for in the, all the years that I've been involved in football. Now, what's really interesting is, okay, yeah, like I said, many owners make decisions for the, their teams, play on their teams, coach their teams, but they don't run a league. And it's also rather interesting that all-star rosters, it's very difficult to find this information on the WFA. That's been the very interesting part. The only roster I've been able to find is the 2014 roster. And she's on it. And rumor has it amongst all... Rumor has it, let's just say, in general in women's football, she's one of the deciding factors behind the roster. So, now where it's the major problem, especially this season I've noticed, they are really, really keen to call her the commissioner when they're releasing press statements regarding Team USA or anything to do with the league, they are very keen to make sure that it says Commissioner Lisa King. And yet, they are also very keen to notify, say that she is part of the WFA, that she's a player, and sometimes they'll do that within the same context. That's where it's been very interesting. 
the latest article they had was regarding how many WFA players are on Team USA. And it stated that 42 of the 45 on the, act, on the starting roster are from Team USA, and 12 members are on Team Canada. Now, where it gets interesting is out of those 42 players, they chose to only interview a member of their own team. That's where the question of conflict of interest comes in. If there are 42 other players, why is the War Angel player the only one interviewed? Could they not reach out to other players before they release their statement? Given how pretty much... How much they're all over social media, I kind of find that hard to believe. But also at the same time, they do have to be careful because in their own bylaws, it does state that they cannot contact players from other teams or other teams once the season begins. So, kind of a catch-22 on their part, but at the same time, kind of, there's where the bias comes in. Now, to give you a little bit of perspective, think about it this way. If Roger Goodell owned an NFL team while being the league's commissioner and made choices for the league that were arguably, that, like, you could argue were in favor of his team, no one would stand for the matter. So why does women's football have to tolerate that? I mean, here's a major issue you have to think about. In the bylaws, it states that there's a contact, conduct issue. You actually have to buy a team that... If there's a conduct issue, you have to report it to the commissioner, or you have to report it to the league. Think about it this way. In just a non-specific situation, you can take it as you want. Say a team owned by the commissioner commits the foul, commit, like does the offense, who do you report it to? You follow the league rules, report it to the, in, to the league heads, and if they choose to dismiss it or deny it, is that fair? Honestly, I don't believe it is. So, and I don't believe somebody can be totally unbiased about running a league and own a team at the same time. There's invested interest that allows you to kind of get away with some stuff. Um, and in my opinion... I personally think that Jeff and Lisa King either need to focus on league exclusively or they need to focus on either, either they need to focus on the league and let the War Angels be owned and coached by somebody totally independent or they recuse themselves from any league titles, decisions, anything that has to do with league responsibility and focus exclusively on their team. For women's sports as a whole to survive and to expand, we cannot have both happen at the same time. Like I said before, if Roger Goodell did the same thing, you only thought he was the most hated man in football. So honestly, why, does, why do we have to suffer with that in women's sports? The reason I kind of bring this up in my podcast is because I'm all about honesty, equality, and sportspersonship. And supposedly that is the mission of women's sports and women's football. And I do honestly believe that if we do bring to light more and more conflicts of interest, more scandals, like bring out the dirty side of things, we can clean it up and make it better. That's kind of the biggest thing. Now, that's, I milled about doing this, bringing it to light, and after a lot of consulting with others about it, I felt like it was the right time. I know that we got a couple weeks left until the game start, but like I said, this the IWFL situation was obviously going to happen eventually, believe it or not. It was going to happen. Um, I don't think, in a way, the league kind of brought that on themselves by putting their bylaws like that. And the WFA, it just needed to be said. It was something that, when it started, it was a good idea, and then it just, over time, seems to rear its ugly head on where this conflict of interest is. Um, 
obviously it'll definitely be something that I will keep an eye on. You'll be, and I will. You you all know I will be the first to say if I notice something wrong, and I will also be the first to admit if something changes. And it'll be very interesting when we've got when the season starts, which is April first, and I will have the. Right before all that, I will give you a rundown of all the games that I can get a hold of and their matchups, and a little bit of my insight of what I think is going to happen. Um, but I will also keep you up to date on Team USA, the IWFL lawsuit, this situation with the WFA, and just women's sport, women's football in general. So. You have been listening to Four Point Stance, Women's Tackle Football on Fox Sports 1340 AM, WHAP. Keep tuning in, and you can listen to us on iTunes. You can listen to us, obviously, on YouTube. Going to be working on getting it on Yelp Sports. And, yeah, just keep tuning in, and you will find out more and more and more and more about the sport of women's tackle football.